You're listening in on an animated discussion about Batman the Animated Series with two experts in their fields. I'm Joshua Unruh, superhero scholar. And I'm Caleb Masters, your friendly neighborhood film critic extraordinaire from the Cinematropolis.com. And today's topic is Season 1, Episode 52, Mudslide. All right, Joshua. So I was the one who insisted we do the follow up to Clayface because, as uh, listeners might remember, we didn't love Feet of Clay parts we love one and 50% two. Fifty percent, yeah, yeah, half of it, yeah, half of it, yeah. But uh, for some reason, I saw somewhere online that there was actually a, a number of people who thought this was a good episode, and I was like, "Well, why not?" There's not, there's only a handful of Clayface episodes. So. It's true, and 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 he's a very like a, a villain full of pathos and tragedy, like. He did make some poor life decisions, but it didn't have to be this, you know? And and I actually agree that this is, oh, 85% a very good episode. Yeah. It's I, just that the other 15% falls right off a cliff. Oh, yeah. bam. We'll be here all week, folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try the veal. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, no, I, I I agree. I think this is a, a solid episode. Uh, yeah, I, I think the last 15% is really nonsensical, and we'll get to that. I think the other 85% you reference isn't great, but it's good. It's I it's would say good. very good because there's just a lot of emotional content. And yes. because we so much tried to start with the title card, I think you actually get the emotional content teased in this phenomenal this is, title this card. This is an incredible title card. I agree. I, I'm, I refuse to start ranking these, but I like have an immediate knee-jerk reaction to go top 10 because it's just so smartly executed. Oh, oh phenomenal. So real quick, if you haven't seen it, I don't know why you're listening to this if you haven't watched the episode, but if somehow you missed this title card, uh, you will recall actually from Feet of Clay that it, it was the, 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 the faces on the the, the, the theater faces, theater faces smiling and frowning. This one clearly made out of clay, uh-huh. like they were porous and kind of crumbly, but not falling apart. In this one, we have only the sad face. It is falling apart, and the shadow that it casts is clay faces face. silhouette. Yes brilliant Excellent. and really telegraphs the emotional impact of the smart part of this episode mm-hmm. the smart majority of this episode well and also of course you it also features that really awesome theme song too they gave clayface a really cool theme it's song. true yeah. yeah yeah again very theatrical and big which is right for matt hagan's personality exactly it, well and also uh, this is the weird disconnect though it is like really sad melancholy which the character is but as yeah. we discussed i'm like i don't feel like he's as sympathetic as this Music cue leads me to believe, but it's really great. He, yes, if we hearken back to Feet of Clay, he certainly starts out more, not entirely sympathetic, which is good. I like a complex character. Yes. So he starts out somewhat sympathetic because he makes these choices uh, to use the Renew You formula to maintain a career he can't have otherwise. It is a shortcut. Like, we're not 100% clear that he couldn't have gotten back there with just years of painful surgery. I mean, he makes a selfish choice. That speeds up the process. Right. We, we can understand this, but he, he's really mean to his best friend. His close friend. His Yeah, for no real reason that we can discern. And he just keeps on making the decisions. And at the point that you are faking your death and not telling your friend and actually hanging out on the street next to him where he's very sad and laughing maniacally, you're no longer sympathetic at all. No, not at all. They do, I think. Tell me your reaction. I think that they right away re-inject some sympathy to him in this episode, though. Well, I just think... Because he's dying. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. And he's visibly dying. It's yeah. not like he's just, oh, I'm dying. You see his, like, you just see the, the, the clay just melting right off his bone. Like, what the resembles The visuals are so good. Oh, incredible. Because you know, it's going to be a minute before you get the exposition about him actually dying, but you know, just from looking, that stuff is not right. He's dripping. He, he isn't pulling things back into himself as quickly. You know, it's just, you can tell right away he's leaving bits behind. Mm-hmm. He's not well. Right, right, yeah. It's, it's very Falling good. apart. And yeah, so inherently you have some sympathy. Uh, but again, for only a short moment, because there is that moment when Batman says, hey, remember I told you I can save your life. And he says, I don't need you, Batman. You know, so I'm, I personally am trying to read that, especially in light of some developments in this episode. So let me circle around to this. I'm trying to read that in the most sympathetic way. So you're Clayface, and there is a man in a bat costume 
who is offering to help solve your extremely complicated and weird medical problem. Maybe don't believe him, right? Like, what what is the expertise that Batman on the label brings to the table that would help you be cured as Clayface? And I think it's the answer the utility, is it's, it's a, none. It's in, a, it's in the utility belt, man. That's, <laughs> that's where the cure's at. Well, the reason I say that I'm reading that in that very sympathetic way is because later we get a plot development that I think really highlights the pathos and the continued bad decisions of Clayface. But in this case, he's making a decision from ignorance instead of selfishness. What I mean is we come to find out that the thing that might actually save him, Wayne Medical has it. Ironically, it's true. Right. It is. I love that development. And it it's what makes me read this as he's like, why would I believe Batman can cure me? I got Bruce Wayne's stuff can help me out. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. He doesn't know. He doesn't like, know. there's a big piece of the puzzle that he's missing that puts him in a place where he makes a very tragic choice. And, and to be honest, a much more understandable tragic choice mm-hmm. because it's not just selfish choice after selfish choice after selfish right. choice. This is a choice from ignorance. Right. Now, another thing I want to note about this episode that I really appreciated that is that it feels like a very logical follow-up to Feet of Clay. So if you recall at the end of Feet of Clay, Batman believes him dead. Well, Batman suspects. Suspects. There may be might something. Not be dead. But also, what am I supposed to do about it? Right. He could literally be anybody. anybody. Who do I? How do I right. find this? This is the first time he's reemerged, but it, it's interesting. It's very logical. Like, hey, this uh, condition he has can't sustain itself. Yeah. So he's falling apart. That makes sense. And naturally, he's going to go to one of the doctors he knows. He's going to go to a doctor he worked on as a with as a consultant uh, in a film he started as a patient. Patient. Also, a doctor who pretty clearly has obsession issues with uh, Matt Hagen. Yes. Well, she's rewatching his movies. Right. Knowing that that bothers him, you know, like that that whole uh, screaming, turn it off and shattering the TV feels like this has come up before. This is not news, but that she sort of can't help herself. And it makes me want to fill in a backstory for them where she was interested in him and he was a real ass about it. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I definitely Because Matt Hagen is a yeah. selfish jerk and we have Alfred pointing out how all of the women he's connected with publicly are starlets, yes. basically, right? They're chosen for their beauty. And so I really want to... And we know Matt Hagen was a selfish jerk. Oh, yeah. So I really want to backfill this space where he knew exactly who to go to uh-huh. and was using her. Oh, he... No, he... Yeah. I, 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 oh, I, I'm convinced he's using her. I don't think she actually... I, he no. does not have any real romantic interest no. in her. She, of course, does with him. Yes. But. Although, again, in a kind of unhealthy way. Oh, like... like oh, Yeah. She's he's fangirl. exploiting she's, her. She's fangirling. Yeah, yeah. Out. He's definitely exploiting her. But the thing I love is, again, this is 1993. It's a show ostensibly for children. And there is this massive subtext that's just barely not text. Right. About this selfish man using this woman mm. who is clearly obsessed with him. Mm. So the reason that's so weird to me is they did a lot of effort in the first third of this thing to make him sympathetic again. Yes. And then just undermine the hell out of it. Oh, at the end. Well, I think that actually ties in with the Matt Hagen we saw in no, Feet of Quiet. You it's know an I mean? on-point character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, uh, it's, 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 it's great that this show is tackling a complex character that's also still not a good guy. Yeah. Sympathetic and still not good. This is a complicated space for the children's show to choose to inhabit. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yeah, I, that's why I say the 85% is, so, is very good to me. There is a lot of serious emotional depth going on in this episode Mm -hmm. um again not so much with batman batman's almost a bit player in his own show he he really is i mean he's involved and it has to you know and he does have an emotional stake he offers to help again even and again at the end after Mm -hmm. clayface has gone off the rails and has tried to murder him right possibly rightfully we'll get to it but i mean he's still offering let me help you let me save you and well even the end when clayface falls off the cliff it's a really sad moment you watch him dissipate Uh uh-huh or or when you see about to reemerge and you see the silhouette of his body and then it just falls it's so it's yeah yeah there's a lot anyway that's what elevates it to very good for me and that, it just so much emotion. Yes. And I do want to note, too, this is going to be his last appearance before the redesign. So yes. uh, I actually have, don't know if I've seen the redesign episode, so I'm very curious to get to those because I thought this was the last time we saw him before Justice League. But no. No. No, he's in two more, I think. And one of them is Robin-centered. Uh, the new Robin that comes in, a younger... Tim Drake. Child Tim Drake version of Robin that comes in after the redesign. And it is also... 
just monumentally full of pathos, but in a very different way. Ooh. Yeah, it's going to be that's going to be, be a really great rediscovery for you. That episode is heart wrenching. I'm excited. It's even more. I would go so far as to say it's even more. I find this episode heart wrenching, even though Clayface is barely sympathetic. But that that one centers on Robin and another character I don't want to get into, and they are both 100 percent sympathetic, and it's it's gut wrenching. It's a punch. So okay, so get ready for that. <laughs> there's a tease. Yeah, very very cool. So tell me, film guy, how many film references did you catch in this uh, this episode about Matt Hagen, the Hollywood actor? Uh, there was a few. There were a few. There there were uh, several. Um, yeah, there's a lot, but. <laughs> Uh, I, I just think it's funny how they basically took all these different uh, Hollywood caricatures for, from actors yeah, especially yeah. and boiled it down into to Matt Hagen, one character. It's true. It's it, really a smart move, honestly. Yes. I mean, if you're going to do a villain who is an actor, go ahead and make him all the worst tendencies of actors. Oh, yes. Just yes, do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, th- I thought it was cool. I uh, uh, one, one little nod. Some of the jokes in this movie were pretty... Pretty funny too, by the way. I love uh, there's the, the 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 line from Alfred when Batman's like at the very beginning of the episode. Batman's like, "All right, I'm gonna come home early." And Alfred says, "Just in time for dinner." Uh-huh. And and then Batman gets these the uh, the silent alarm go off, and uh, he said, and Alfred says, uh, "Please don't take this the wrong way, but your goose is cooked." <laughs> and he pulls the goose <laughs> out of the a oven. Goose. Yeah. Oh gosh, I know that's a dad joke. If there was one, but in there this episode, he is. But it's right? So funny. That's a good dad joke, right? Yes. The one from Alfred that I, there are two, there's one I really appreciate and one that kind of skeeved me out. Okay. The one I really appreciated is when Batman is at the computer analyzing Clayface's leftovers right. from the from the crime yes. scene. And Batman says he's losing his integrity. And Alfred says, I wasn't aware he had any to begin with. Oh, so. yeah. That was good. That was funny. Sick burn. Yeah. Now, the one that kind of grosses me out is when they find the doctor who's helping him. They figure out who it is. And Batman asks, what's her stake in this? And Alfred's response is, maybe she just likes mud baths. I was oh, like, wow. oh, I'm squicked out. Oh, boy. I didn't even think, I didn't even like process that. I am right. not like, good with boy. that. I mean, that's a good burn, but I'm also like, ew, Alfred, ew, 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 Alfred, ew. what's your experience with mud baths? Right. I don't want, I don't want to know. Uh, also, uh, no shade, whatever your kink is, whatever you're into there, Alfred, but gross. Gross. <laughs> I'm not into that thing. Speaking of mud baths, um, I actually found it really a, a very interesting animation choice when Clayface actually eats Batman, basically. Eats in oh, quotes. Oh, yeah. I, was, I didn't expect that. I was like, holy crap. It's he's horrifying. Going he, like, absorbs him. And I was like, oh, crap. And then Clayface is over here laughing maniacally about how he just ate Batman cannibalism. And, and it's worse when Clayface chills out and he's saying, I can feel his heartbeat. Uh, slowing i was like this is worse than the laughter oh man man and it's just gross the bat face coming out it's really smart choice for this creepy episode i think children might have been scarred for life when they saw this one i don't remember it affecting me but i was also you know a teenager at this point so Mm. so yeah i i really like uh the aesthetic of the lab is very old frankenstein it's oh, always oh, on yeah. a dark. Every yeah. time they're in the lab, well, it's a dark machine and stormy. Is very, night. very yeah. Frankenstein looking. Yes, we 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 get a little reference to a Bates Motel. Yes, the Bates Motel. I did I did catch <laughs> it that means one. Means nothing. No, but it's great. It, it, it's like they were just having fun. They're like, well, we're we're working on an actor, so let's just go ahead and throw a movie reference. In the there. one that I am legitimately embarrassed I didn't see coming until he did it is that we've heard the doctor's name several times right. throughout the the right. show, both Doctor surname and uh, you know in conversation with with matt but i didn't prepare for matt hagan screaming stella like a streetcar named desire uh, <laughs> oh my god i didn't even think about that josh that's a good pull that's a great so, pull i just was like i heard her name a hundred times how did i not expect this yeah because like because we'd caught I snuck it in we'd caught yeah, yeah. a bunch of references uh-huh. Before then, but it's in character with Clayface. He's so over the top. Right. You could even imagine that in his head, because Matt Hagen does not actually care about her, he's doing a streetcar named Desire, like in his own head, you know. He's playing it out. I mean, that's the great thing about that character, too. It's always a performance. Always a performance. Even when he's fighting Batman, it's very, like, just... Mm, okay. Theatrics. Let's talk about the 15% that is really dumb and and right on the edge of ruins the episode for me. Are you talking about how Batman almost kills Clayface? Yes, I am talking and about that. And basically gives him a death sentence? Yes, I am talking about that. Thing. Okay, here's all for I need. For no reason. reason. 
So we're talking about Batman coming into the lab in the midst of Clayface almost being cured and just shutting off the machine. Mm -hmm. Why? And there were opportunities to set up a reason why, but instead it just kind of makes him look like a moral monster. No, it does. Like, like it seemed, because here's the thing, as far as we can tell, it's working. Exactly. It's working just fine. He's about to be Matt Hagen again. Batman's like, no, you broke the law, so death. And this is after he's offered to help him. Yeah. Again, and will again after that moment. I I don't understand it. I it's it's it is a it's clearly like a plot choice. Well, yeah, they needed to get like a final confrontation in there somehow, but it just feels weird. Or giving him just even like a one or two line explanation yep. for why he would stop. That radiation machine. isn't good for anybody. Right. You're still living tissue. Uh -huh. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. The mutagen. Like there's Say a, some there's a stuff missing... that you can't know unless you work at way you know you have stake in Wayne yeah, Medical. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. unstable. That is not going to stabilize you. It's going to make it worse. Or there's like a missing ingredient to whatever yes, the juice there's is. There's a yeah. million things that could have. Batman literally runs out of the Batcave, saying to Alfred, "There's no time to explain, dude. Take 15 seconds and explain, and also say, and it's going to kill him. Yeah, literally anything, and." <laughs> I guess it bothers me so much because there were so many other really nuanced choices going oh, yeah. into this episode that for that to just be so out of nowhere and ham-fisted and honestly paints Batman in a very negative light. Oh, yeah. I didn't like it. He just stopped a guy from getting a... Ch it's like if you had a chance to cure cancer and all of a sudden Batman's like, not today. For no reason. For like, no just reason. Flip the switch for no reason. Yeah. I don't want to say it ruins the episode for me, but it is. It does really like stick out. You know, it's, it's it, inconsistent. We know, actually, I think this is a, a great way for us to kind of harken back to, I think, episode conversations we had about how he talks about women and the a cat in the claw, maybe, or was it the red claw? Oh, where Batman talks about women, women in a different in the cat episode. In the claw. And, yeah. Well, we, whenever he says something yeah. that's when he says something that's very uncharacteristic of both our understanding of Batman as a character and also yes. how he acts throughout the series generally, you're like, ooh. Yeah, maybe don't do that. And it just feels weird, and it makes it kind of really hurts the the episode because it feels inconsistent. It with feels the inconsistent. Yeah, in, in a show that doesn't belabor its continuity, but does expect there to be some continuity of character. Right. Those moments really stand out, and I feel like there's two explanations for this, and neither one justifies it, but it it's sort of understandable. The easy one is they're under a deadline. Oh you yeah, know? yeah. They they made this entire show behind deadline. Oh sure. And there's a there's a good enough moment where you just go with it, I right. guess. I mean, and again, it's good enough. You put so much effort into the rest of in this episode in particular. You put so much effort into all of this emotional nuance for to kind of ruin it in one second is unfortunate. The other one is a um, the other one is a concept that uh, may be useful to you as a film critic, actually. Oh, sure. Um, in fact, I'd be interested to know if uh, you have a term for this. Sure. In film, um, I get this one from Lonnie Diane Rich, my co-host on my MCU podcast, Listen Up A-Holes. She uses the term terroir, which originates with, with wineries. It's the, the word that is given to the flavor the grapes absorb from the land around them. So oh, like sure, sure. You're, you, you have an oak tree, you will get oak uh, you know, undertones. Or I'm going to plant lavender next to these grapes because I want lavender to be part of this wine. It's the flavor that you absorb. Lonnie talks about that in terms of fiction as this is the stuff that gets absorbed into the fiction that nobody thought about. And a lot of times this is sexist, racist themes. Right, like they just right, get absorbed. Right, right. The idea that Batman, who was a few episodes before nearly murdered by a brilliant PhD femme fatale. Right. But in this episode, we're going to talk about it like dangerous women are a shock. Yes. It's terroir. Right. You got a different writer. Uh-huh. Odds are this is, you know, this is still the Hollywood machine. Odds are you're talking about a straight white man. He doesn't even think about the sexism that he's just absorbed, it right. being 1993, and yep. it winds up in the piece. Yes. I bring that up because I think we get examples of both of this. In The Cat and the Claw, it's terroir. In Mudslide, it's the good enough. Yeah. And that's where you see that. That's And that's, you know, whenever you're, you're really breaking down you know, critically, evaluating, I mean, film or television or, con I mean, anything... But you can tell 
whenever you, you you experience so many high points and you see the mm-hmm. potential the mm-hmm. show has, and when you see it take kind of a lazy shortcut, that's when it starts to the you, you start to really think, well, why would it? Why would they not include yes. this thing? Oh, because they were probably on a deadline, had to push the script through as fast as possible, and we didn't have time to record another line from Conroy. Whatever, it's I get pa- it. It's a pass. It's it's passable. Yeah. That's certainly less unpleasant to me than the terroir idea but it also the, the, the terroir definitely is that, a, those, yeah. that's gross every yeah. time yeah this is just disappointing yes yeah so yeah yeah so joshua before we jump into alternate uh, media recommendations is just as far as recommending this episode i don't feel like this is an essential b task i think it's a pretty good one though yeah i would agree not essential but if you want to see like how good and nuanced the show can be up until the point that it isn't this is a really mature yes episode. definitely very mature and maybe I don't know if if I don't know. We need to watch. We need to finish watching the cl- uh, the Clayface Saga. <laughs> Indeed, uh, yeah. For me to decide which is the definitive episode, because I didn't feel like the first episode was essential per se. It is very good, ne- necessary in that it's an origin. Yes, but you could also just watch the second half. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And then this one, I get you not wanting to label it essential. It's good, but it's so it's good. good. Like, it is like good. there's a lot going on. So yeah, we know. That things never seem to quite go well for Clayface because we see how he ends up in Justice League. We'll get there, friends. Uh-huh. But yeah, you know what? Let's just put a pin in the uh, Clayface saga because that episode with Robin is going to be a thing. Ooh, ooh, man. Well, Joshua, as always, I want to wrap up with alternate media recommendations. Um, I have a deep cut on this one. Oh, tell me. So it's a little bit of reversery, right? So I have a film about a genealogist who has a twin who happens to be played by Jeremy Irons. They both actually become infatuated with an actress. Doctor is obsessed with the actress, similar to this mm-hmm. episode. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's two of them. So there's twins, and, and she doesn't know there are twins. Oh. So a little bit of like identity shenanigans going on there. I like that. Uh-huh. And it's directed by David Cronenberg. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I like where this is it's headed. Good. Dead Ringers. Check it out. It's a, it's a ride. It's a title. Yes. It's a trifecta. I'm here for it. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, You know, the Clayface ones are always a hard one. I was trying yeah. to think outside the box for that. But I think if you like Clayface the way his body... If you're in a body horror, a body any, horror is any, very anyway, Cronenbergian. Yeah, yeah. Cronenberg. So what do you got for me, Joshua? So it's a little bit of a weird sideways cut because partly because of the lab and partly because of the dark and stormy night and the tragic monster aspect of Clayface, I want to think about Frankenstein. Ooh, yeah. Okay. But I don't necessarily want to go to Mary Shelley's because I think that the monster is very sympathetic in the original work. Right? Oh, yeah, and Frankenstein, absolutely. So I'm going to suggest the first season of Penny Dreadful. Oh, I like it. Penny Dreadful is a complicated piece, and I am not going to sit here and tell you that it is good, but it is very, very interesting. And if you go in realizing that it's basically a character study and the plot does not matter, I think you'll enjoy it. And the version of Frankenstein's monster that you get in this is very clay-faced to me in that he begins very sympathetic, but the longer he talks, the more obviously selfish and terrible he gets. So he's not necessarily the star. It's an ensemble cast, but I would say go watch Penny Dreadful and keep your eye on the devolution of the monster's personality. Excellent. wraps up this animated discussion. Caleb, where can people go to continue the conversation with you? Well, Joshua, you can always find me on Twitter talking about film, television, video games, and all sorts of other pop culture goodness at C Masters Talk. That's letter C Masters Talk. I'm also the editor in chief and film critic at the Cinematropolis. And we publish these in-depth essays on all types of different films, often time including science fiction, superhero films, all the stuff you'd want to read about. And you can find all these articles at thecinematropolis.com. Joshua, what about you? I'm also most active on Twitter, where you can find me easily enough at Joshua Unruh. And remember that an animated discussion is a Pulp Diction Productions program and is 100% supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can keep this and our other shows in production, check out patreon.com slash Pulp Diction Productions. So make sure to join us on our next episode when things get extra magical when we discuss season one, 
episode 54, Zatanna. Until next time, we'll see you back here. Same bat time, same bat channel.